Hi, and welcome to another episode of the We Need Roads podcast. Because silence, Earthling, my name is Darth Vader. I'm an extraterrestrial from the planet Vulcan. It was a little too long a title, and we probably get sued. I'm your host, Neil Gregory, and today I'm joined by my co-host, David Long. How's it going, David? It's going good, Neil. Uh, you know, you know, no one's going to get that reference. And I've, had, I've even had people that have not understood the podcast name, which I feel like we're going to have to, we're going to have to clarify. So the famous, there's obviously a Back to the Future theme going on with the, with the podcast in the title. Why didn't they get that from the logo? Yeah, like the, the, the logo and like all the stuff that you've been tweeting, but... Uh, for those of you that don't know, the famous line in Back to the Future is where we're going, we don't need roads. And they went to 2015, where we did need roads. So we needed roads in 2015. It's not the best joke. It's not that, the best that, name. That's not even a joke, because it's factually incorrect. I know, I know, they had flying it's... cars, so they didn't need roads. <laughs> it's, an, it's, it's an inverted play on we didn't need roads. It's, we needed it's, roads. Uh, admittedly, it's not the best name, but... It was all that we could get. Yeah, we, we couldn't... All other, all other podcast names were taken from us, so... And with that, we're on to what's going to be coming up in the show today. In our new section, we're going to take a look at developments in Netflix's adaptation of Neil Gaiman's epic Sandman series. And David will round us off with news about the HBO Game of Thrones spin-offs. Yeah, there's been some news from the Game of Thrones prequels front, which I feel like nobody is interested in anymore, which is a real shame because Game of Thrones tanked so badly, nobody now cares about the prequels. But... Duncan Egg has been revealed to be in early development. So I'm going to be touching on that for a little bit. Also, in the What We've Been Watching section, I'll be discussing two films that both deal with issues resulting from asteroids being blown up with Love and Monsters and Gerard Butler, Comet Puncher. Sorry, that's Gerard Butler's Greenland. And on the TV side of things, I'll be taking a trip back to Pawnee, Indiana for Netflix's Parks and Recreation. David, what have you been watching? Uh, I've been watching MonsterVerse recently, trying to get myself into the groove for Godzilla vs. Kong. And I've also finished The Crown, which I'm going to just slightly touch upon, uh, tell you how, if, whether I liked it or not. Do you want to get into it, Neil? News. So first up, we have casting news for Netflix's much-anticipated Sandman adaptation, with relative unknown Tom Sturridge taking the lead as Dream, a.k.a. the original Morpheus. And although we know very little about the actor at this point, he definitely looks apart. Uh, from there on, there's some inspired casting choices with Game of Thrones' Gwendolyn Christie, Brienne of Tarth herself, signing on to play Lucifer herself, one of Dream's main antagonists throughout the story. You have the casting of Sanjeev Bhaskar and Asim Chowdhury as Cain and Abel. Um, that's another master stroke as they're more known for their comedy and sitcom work, so their casting is definitely going to bring a fresh angle to the characters. More up in the villainy stakes, you've got Logan main villain Boyd Holbrook, taking on the role of the Corinthian, one of Dream's early adversaries. And where would we be without yet another Game of Thrones actor out of work, Charles Dance, coming in as occultist Roderick Burgess. Now, once mentioned as unfilmable, many have tried to make Sandman into a film and TV show before, with the most recent attempt helmed by Joseph Gordon-Levitt that stalled in 2016 after three years in pre-production. The original comic ran for 75 issues, so in theory the show could run for seven seasons if needed. Uh, David, do you know much about The Sandman? I know absolutely nothing about it. Why was it deemed unfilmable? Right, so Sandman essentially begins with a being called Dream. Uh, Dream is one of the endless, and I think it's got a lot in common with previous Neil Gaiman works, like uh, American Gods. So he's an all-powerful being, more powerful than a god, and um, he just shapes and influences reality where he goes. So he's essentially like a super-powered Thanos, but a bit more benevolent. Uh, but it starts, the very first issue, with Dream being captured in an occult ritual and held prisoner for 70 years. Now, on his escape, he sets about rebuilding his kingdom, which has fallen into disrepair in his absence. Uh, the comic really began as an elaborate fantasy while adding in elements of classical mythology. And as the story progressed, we see how Dream and his siblings shape all our realities at their whim, and essentially humanity, was just pawn- we were just pawns to them. I mean, it's really epic fantasy of the highest order. Right, so they couldn't film it because it was just the visuals would have been too expensive. I th- like, that's I think, why it was deemed unfilmable. I think it would never work as a film because there's too much plot and story to fit into even a trilogy. I mean, it was a 75 comic arc. There's no way you fit that into uh, even three films, I think, and do it justice. And yeah, like I say, um, visually, I think the effects work would just not have been there in previous uh, attempts. Uh, but with the Netflix money behind it, I'm a lot more hopeful we're going to get something that lives up to the hype. 
Right, yeah, well, it sounds interesting. I mean, what can I expect? Can I expect something like American Gods? I think it'll share some DNA with that, purely just because they're both written by Neil Gaiman. And um, that whole kind of base storyline of mythic beings with unimaginable powers uh, wielding their destinies and, like, the small human characters being little flies that are barely, you know, even noticed by the uh, dealings of these godlike characters. But also, it's really good. It's really funny, it's really dark, and I can't wait. It's one of those comic books that was regarded as, like, the peak of the genre, like Alan Moore's Watchmen, you know. Everyone's like, Sandman is is one of the great last un, unfilmed works. And okay. uh, now, hopefully, we're going to get to see it. Yeah, man, uh, well, it sounds, it sounds like it's going to be good. I'm, I am looking forward. You've definitely sold that, sold that to me. Excellent. Good, good, good. And uh, I think you've got a bit of news for us about some more HBO Game of Thrones spin-offs. They've got, they've got the two, two new spin-offs uh, currently in the works. There's House of Dragon, which I think everybody kind of already knows, and there's also the newly announced Duncan Egg, which is going to cover the tales of Sir Duncan the Tall and Aegon the Fifth, who's also known as Aegon the Unlikely. He was mentioned in Game of Thrones a few times, and uh, Egg, the name Egg, was mentioned when... Uh, if anyone can remember when Master Eamon was dying, his last words were, Egg, I dreamt I was an old man. Or something along those lines. <laughs> That's this egg. That's the egg from Duncan Egg. So we're going to get that tale. There's not really much that we can say about it because it is in very early development. Uh, if you're interested, you can read uh, A Knight of the Seven Kingdoms, which goes through all of Duncan Egg's tales. Uh, it's going to cover events in... Westeros' history, such as the Blackfire Rebellion, uh, the Tawny of Ashford, there's going to involve trial by combat. Like a good trial by combat, can't go wrong with a good trial by combat. Having said that though, David, I, I'm probably not going to read the books because I still want George R.R. R. Martin to finish writing bloody Game of Thrones. It's, it's only about 11 years now since he started writing it, so... I'd just like him to finish that before he dicks around with anything else, if I'm honest. Yeah, I mean, I think I think a lot of fans are getting impatient with him, but, you know, you've got to think it's an author's work. He's not doing, you know, he's not doing it for the fans. He's doing it for himself. It's his, it's his work. It's his project. You can't write, rush somebody on his project. If it's taking him a time, it's taking him time. And I quite like when George R. R. Martin, on his Not A Blog, he mentions that he's struggling to write he has days like normal people do he's so relatable he has days where he says i just can't get anything done today i think a lot of fans though i i think they they don't want the robert jordan syndrome where he actually unfortunately you know carks it before he finishes the book yeah i mean we're gonna get we're gonna touch upon that later in this later in this Definitely. episode but uh yeah robert jordan did sadly die during during uh writing so what can you tell me so far about house of the dragon yeah, House of the Dragon is going to be, uh, I mean, expect everything from the same sort of theme as Game of Thrones. Expect good plot, expect interesting and strong characters, conflict, intrigue, um, immersion into the into the world. It's going to be based dragons. on oh, and a lot of dragons. It's going to be based on the civil war between the Targaryens. Uh, the Dance of Dragons is, is, what it's going to, is what it's called. And I don't want to get too much into like the plot of the show because you can read about it in A Fire and Blood, which is another one of George Martin's books. Well, it's funny you should mention that because I've, I'm about halfway through Fire and Blood and I got so bored and basically gave it up. And this is where I think the show's going to run into a little problem. And it's purely because, when we've discussed this before we started recording, that... Um, it's not a book. It's a history of the Targaryen timeline, which means yeah. as much as you can go with the story, it's it gets it got so repetitive to me. There will be a good Targaryen king, then there'll be a bad Targaryen king, then there'll be a couple of good ones and there'll be peace, then there'll be some bad ones and there'll be war. And it's just I was reading it going, oh, this is a good one. Oh, that's a bad one. And it just got boring and repetitive. I think it depends on how you look at it. I th I, I for personally I I listen to it as an audio book and I. I found it fascinating. I thought how they presented the information uh, from you had certain sources all covering the same event. So you had a source from uh, the, a maester, you had a, a dwarf uh, jester or whatever he was, who was also, they, and they all had different varying uh, depictions on events based off the political or... Yeah, um, you're, not, you're, various... you're still not really selling it to me, to be honest. Um, <laughs> what, what has piqued my interest in the show, though, is... 
because they're a little bit further along. So, I mean, from what I remember, they basically just kept the sets in uh, Ireland from Game of Thrones originally and rent kept renting them out to use them for the new show, which um, this is now going to be the first one out the gates by the looks of thing. But it is the casting of Paddy Constantine as King Viserys, um, yeah. which is just awesome casting. I mean, Paddy Constantine is basically awesome in everything he's ever in. So that's definitely going to get me to watch a show, even if it wasn't a Game of Thrones show. I would watch it because he is in it. He's that good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's definitely some strong some strong actors that are already tied with the project. I mean, uh, Matt Smith's on board, Paddy Constantine, as you've already said. Uh, uh, Olivia, Olivia Cook, Cook from yeah. Ready Player One, so it'd be great to see her doing more. That'd be yeah, uh, Emma Darcy and uh, Eve Best are all, um, are all tied into the project. So there's some serious acting talent there that's going to be involved. And uh, to be honest, I'm just hoping to see uh, Balerion the Dread make the uh, make the big screen. My boy Balerion, he's um, if you thought Drogon was Your cool, boy. Neil, in Game of Thrones, wait until you see <sighs> Balerion. I don't know. You see one dragon, you see them all. Just imagine, just imagine, just uh, he's. It, I guess it is just like the same dragon, but like a big, a big dragon. He's huge. And now moving on from that, there's been some breaking news that's come out of the Last of Us TV show. <laughs> <laughs> Pedro Pascal has been cast as Joel and Bella Ramsey, the little badass who also plays Liana Mormont in Game of Thrones, is playing Ellie. Neil, your reactions on the casting? Uh, I think it's great. I mean, clearly Pedro Pascal knows where the bodies are buried and has the best agent in the business in a minute. And yeah, Bella Ramsey, she's also just been in the second series of his Dark Materials and she was very good in that as well. But yeah, I mean, she made her name as Liana, Liana Mormont. Um absolutely just kicking ass when she was about eight it's gonna be it's gonna be really exciting to watch i mean have you have you played the last of us the game neil uh no i'm xbox only i'm afraid my friend okay well prepare to cry your eyes out at the beginning i mean it's gonna hit you harder than up i do know that the creative team behind it did chernobyl so i'm not expecting it to be a laugh riot yeah no it's gonna it's gonna be dark and it's gonna be sad and potentially the best show of the year Maybe. You're definitely going to shed a tear, man. What to watch. If you're sick of dour, depressing apocalypse films, then Love and Monsters is a welcome respite from the usual doom and gloom. Admittedly, after mankind successfully destroys an asteroid headed for Earth, the resulting fallout does mutate all cold-blooded animals into massive monsters and humanity essentially gets wiped out. But seven years later, we catch up with our main protagonist, the affable Joel, played by the Maze Runners Dylan O'Brien, who was living in a bunker with some other survivors, but was separated from his girlfriend Amy seven years earlier. They still talk via radio, and Joel decides to make the week-long trip to Amy's bunker, which would be fine, except Joel has zero survival skills and a history of freezing in critical moments. But what we get is a post-bug apocalypse road movie where Joel traverses a colourful, overgrown, monster-inhabited world to reach his girlfriend. Now, I really enjoyed this movie, as I knew little of the cast or the story going in, and was expecting another dour, mid-paced, post-apocalyptic misery fest. Instead, what I got was a colourful, more upbeat film with some amazing monster effects, um, and we see, we also get one of the single best dog acting performances that I've ever seen. Uh, early on in the film, Joe encounters a dog he names Boy, and if there were a dog Oscars, David, Boy would have a streak longer than Meryl Streep. Uh, it definitely had... <laughs> It definitely has echoes of a boy and his dog, Zombieland and I Am Legend, but for such a mid-budget movie, I was really impressed with the film. It was slated for a cinema release in the States last year, but eventually came out on VOD last October. Now, we are still waiting for an official release date here in the UK, but we're going to bung the trailer on our Twitter below, and we'll let you know where you can find it once it comes out. Uh, but uh, a film that only had a £30 million budget, I can't wait to see what director Michael Matthews does next. It sounds like a better version of Garth Edwards' Monsters. Did you see that? Uh, yeah, I mean, that was more an arty film. It, it, it does sound a bit like Monsters, but this is... If you think... If you take the general basic idea of the two of those films, but then throw in the, a bit of comedy... It's not as comedy as Zombieland, but it's still pretty funny. And I just I just think for the budget they had, and the, the, the monster effects are amazing in it. I mean, there's just a, a gigantic frog that just looks, wouldn't have looked out of place in Star Wars, you know. And <laughs> it's in a cheap film that costs 30 million. Um, no, I was, I was really impressed with that film. And like I say, um, when, once it's officially got a release out of over here, I'll definitely go and see it again. But from giant monsters to perhaps the king of the monsters, David, what have you been watching? <laughs> uh, I've been watching, well, I've been catching up on the Monsterverse. 
Uh, I feel like everything's got a universe these days. Um, but I've been watching Godzilla, the 2014 Godzilla, not the one that came out in the 90s. That was just utter cr- crud. Um, Roland Emmerich's one with Matthew Broderick, I believe. Yeah, I'd rather just forget about it, if I'm honest. It had did a good you, soundtrack, uh, though. Although, although did you, have you seen the um, the thing that came out afterwards where you had the Japanese Godzilla versus the American Godzilla? And the I'm, Japanese... I'm guessing the Japanese won one, right? <laughs> just, it, to say it was a fight would be an understatement. <laughs> it, was, it was just an arse whooping. It'd be like putting you in the ring with Conor McGregor, then. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, yeah, well, I'd probably just try running away the entire time. Um, but, yeah, anyway, I've been watching Godzilla in uh, build-up to the release of Godzilla vs. Kong. I mean, it had been a long time since I'd watched Godzilla. I, to be honest, I couldn't really remember anything about it, so I wanted to get back into the groove. And uh, I remember a lot of people hating it when it was released. But I, I, don't, I don't know why. I thought it was a really good film. I felt like yeah, Brian Cranston was underutilised because he was clearly the best character. But I yeah, felt I mean... like... You you bring in Walter White straight after Breaking Bad when he was at the peak of his sort of fame at the time, mm. and then it's I mean he's he he disappears from the film early on, shall we say? Yeah, yeah. I mean he's he's completely like like I said he's completely underutilized. But I felt like the foreshadowing of the film, the whole like all the little Easter eggs that were involved, that watching it for the second time, I picked up on a bunch of them, and I felt like oh that was really clever. That was like half like it was really good like directing to put that I, in there. Yeah, I mean, who gave again? It was uh, was it Garth Edwards who did the it original? It was, yeah, it was. It was it Garth was. Edwards, yeah. I think I think a lot of people's biggest problem with the film, and to me it wasn't an issue, was that it spent time building to it. Like the first time you see Godzilla, it needs to be epic and iconic. And he he, he did the Jaws thing, hold off on showing the monster until the end of the film. And yeah, I, th- I think people didn't want that. They wanted to see Monster Smash. Yeah, I think of a lot of the critics were like, there wasn't enough Godzilla, uh, which is funny because I also then went on to watch Godzilla King of the Monsters, where most of the critics were, it's too much Godzilla. You can so never have almost... too much Godzilla. <laughs> yeah. It's almost like they couldn't win. But uh, I went on to watch Godzilla King of the Monsters. You can't fault the film when it comes to pure spectacle. I mean, it's just a popcorn film, like, at, at its at its best, really. I mean, you just I mean, want to sit back and just enjoy it as pure spectacle. I did rewatch it myself again recently, and um, <laughs> what just makes me laugh is that the main villain of the film is essentially an eco terrorist, and is actually supposed to be a good person at the start of the film. I mean, the script is terrible in it, man. It's yeah, just... I mean, the uh, some of the character decisions in Godzilla: King of the Monsters is just. <laughs> it's just borderline ridiculous. And the, the dialogue, um, the dialogue is just. Yeah, I mean, horrific. oh god, I hoped I was, I was hoping, for all throughout the film, that the stupid bloke that's just literally in the film to do nothing but count stuff down, and he comes I up with exactly these stupid jokes all throughout. You I was are, so hoping he'd get killed. You are talking it. about Bradley Whitford, man. Like he was Josh the from the West thing, Wing. He was the worst thing in it. Okay, but he played. Didn't he play exactly the same role, pretty much, in Cabin in the Woods? Yeah, but Cabin in the Woods, it fit. It it's fit funny. with Cabin in the Woods. <laughs> yeah, it's a good. It, Cabin in the Woods. It's a, is a good, funny horror film. But I think. Yeah, yeah. I, I just with Godzilla King of Monsters, it just didn't fit with the to- with the film at all. He was just this annoying, obnoxious character who I wanted Godzilla to burn. Fair enough. I I, I think out of all the monster verse films so far, actually, the biggest problem they have is. They always try to put too much emphasis on human characters and what they're doing. We just want to see giant monsters and apes smash each other. That's it. That's all we want to see in these films. If someone, if I'd love to see a director with the balls to go, do you know what? I'm going to do a film with no dialogue or humans. I'm literally just going to have some monsters beating the shit out of each other with no human involvement. That would take giant balls. And do you know what? It would be a hit. Because people yeah. are like, yeah. I've been I don't know if you would do. I feel like you need to have some sort of plot driving the story. No. See, <laughs> with, look, if you get Andy Serkis to do Kong again, like, he acts, man. You don't need dialogue from it. You get someone with a level of, like, uh, CGI work that they can do that. Having said that, I mean, yeah, the characters are, in, are terrible in all these films. The uh, dialogue's terrible in them. Um, but they're B-films. That's what you want. You want The best spectacle. multiverse film at the moment is definitely Kong. Right? Skull Island? Skull no. Island. Skull yeah. Island, yes, definitely. And I think that works because it's funny. The char- And this is what we get back to with the characters. Because it's set in Vietnam and all your characters are your typical army cliches that you've seen a million times before, you have one line from a guy, you know his character, you know exactly what's going to happen with him. And it's a shorthand. You don't have all this crap 
trying to fill in people's backstories. In a way, it kind of almost reminds you of the classic film. You know, it reminds me of Predator in a way. They're in the middle of a jungle. Somebody's trying to kill them, and they're trying to escape. If you're going to rip off a film, why not rip off a good one? Yeah, I, said, so, uh, I guess with Predator, it was kind of like stealthy, whereas Godzilla, it could, I think you'd know if Godzilla was coming. Oh yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, yeah, like, <laughs> and also it was it was Kong Skull Island we were talking about. Oh yeah, <laughs> they haven't met yet. I mean, having said that, you know, it's got a lot of DNA with Predator, I think, in that it's a bunch of guys in the, ar- uh, in the army stuck in the jungle and they're trying to survive. Yeah, Obviously, it's actually a rescue mission, isn't it? It's a rescue yeah. mission. Saving Private Kong. It, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, have, you seen, have you seen the trailer for Godzilla vs. Kong yet? I, I have, and I've got some questions, like I think the rest of the internet. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I was, I was a bit of a sucker for that trailer. I'm not gonna lie. I mean, the second like the sort of rap music gets in and you and Godzilla punt, I mean, Kong punches Godzilla in his tiny little head. You're like, boom, yes, let's go. And it, I mean, I did get me pumped a little bit. I mean, Kong's doubled in size as well since he was like since the 70s. He's been eating his greens. He's now yeah, yeah. Full, he's man Kong, not he kid Kong now. He's alpha Kong now. Um, but I, I, yeah, I mean, I, do you know what? I think it's, it looks like a, like everything else. I think it's going to be a fun B movie. And I just hope they give enough time to them fighting each other. Uh, I don't want dialogue with terrible characters. I mean, and it looks like we're going to get that. There's an annoying kid in a trailer already. And I think Godzilla's going to do... Uh, or or there's, there's going to be the King Kong moment where he protects the little girl or something and... I think here's the thing, right? Um, if you look at a fight between these two, surely Godzilla will win because he's got nuclear fire breath. <laughs> Kong's just a giant monkey. He just catch fire. <laughs> well, but I think it would be cool to see him see Kong like using iconic buildings such as like the Empire State Building, which he climbs that as, like, would, as a shield. That would be his... a brilliant comeback. Yes. Yeah. I mean, he, all these little planes flying around. Yeah. I mean, that would be the biggest FU to the original uh, film. In the, that would be great, yeah. Uh, right here. Now, if he hits Godzilla with the Empire State Building, 10 stars, <laughs> all the Oscars, best film of all time. And then, at the end, and then at the end of the film, you have Jeff Goldblum walks in and goes, it was the beast that killed the beast. <laughs> Give it all the Oscars. Yes. Give Jeff Goldblum best acting Oscar for five, li- five seconds <laughs> for, at the for end. For that one scene. For that one line at the end, yeah. Or get Sam Neill. I'm good. Ivan can do it. Yeah, I mean, I think we, we we talked about this earlier before we started. We both think the same thing, that they're probably only going to actually fight for the first, what, like, hour of the film. And then there's going to be an even bigger threat that comes along that they're going to have to team up and strike. Or and then... they're going to stop fighting because they realise both their mothers are called Martha. Or Mothra, in this case. <laughs> Mothra. Mothra. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah I, I, think, I think you're right. I think, I think someone will be controlling one of the characters... And yeah, it's Godzilla, isn't fighting. it? They're building Godzilla up as the uh, as, as a villain. villain. Some someone's like controlling Godzilla somehow, is influencing him. Right. So but it's then... clearly going to be Monarch, right? They're the shady guys trying to like do shit and yeah, potentially badly yeah, be all the time. Eco terrorist group out there or something. Because I mean, it worked so well in the last film, didn't it? But uh, yeah, no, you know what? I, I'm looking forward to lots of Monster Smash Smash, and uh, I think that's coming out very soon, isn't it? Yeah, yeah 31st of March, 2021. But nothing you know but a quick Google. I, I, I probably will pay for that. I, I've got to admit, if the reviews are good when it comes out and everyone's like, do you know what it does, what it says on the tin, I'm probably going to pay for it. Yeah, you can always get like a seven day free trial or something for these things, can't you? And just <laughs> to see it if you like it, brilliant. And if you want to continue watching other content on there, great. If not, eh, just cancel your subscription. So from the king of the monsters to the king of the parks? No. Yeah, uh, anyway, yeah, yeah that, works. that works. Right. Okay. Yeah. So um, I've been rewatching Parks and Rec for the third time now. Uh, the whole series has just dropped on Netflix, so all seven seasons are now available. And it was created by Greg Daniels and Michael Schur, who for me are the undisputed kings of the sitcom right now. Daniels cut his teeth on early episodes of The Simpsons in King of the Hill before his biggest hit was The American Office. Schur went on to create Brooklyn Nine-Nine and The Good Place. So Parks and Rec, between the two of them, you can easily sit in the middle of all those shows. Yet it was lucky to initially survive. Taking the same mock documentary approach as The Office, the first season only ran six episodes. It sidelined most of the best actors in the show with a singular focus on Leslie's plot point of filling in the pit. Chris Pratt was only originally cast as a guest star and his character of Andy Dwyer was an annoying idiot for most of the season before he actually became a charming one. 
uh, later on in the show. But seriously, the biggest problem with season one was fuck Mark Brendanowitz. This character was initially set up as Leslie's unrequited love interest, but the character was so slimy and douchey it just didn't work at all. But as I tell many people, get through to the second season and come on, on Netflix it's barely over two hours. Brendanowitz is slowly phased out. Jerry and Donna are actually given more than a few lines, and April's sarcastic, grumpy teen is given much more screen time. Chris Pratt's Andy Dwyer becomes much more likeable once the showrunners decided to keep him around full time, and they somehow, somehow their attempts to keep him in the show just make it even funnier going forwards. He's an idiot, but a likeable one, and his overwhelming positiveness is infectious. Of course, where would we be without the man, the myth, the legend, Ron motherfucking Swanson? <laughs> the writers give Ron much more to do with the introduction of his crazy ex-wives, Tammy 1, Tammy 2, as well as his love-hate relationship with Leslie, and his much more larger love affair with eggs and bacon and whiskey. Ron motherfucking Swanson. Is that his full um, name? That is, that's literally his middle name, if you look it up <laughs> on the internet places. Uh, but for me, what really put the show over the top was getting rid of the shitty Brandanowitz. And you add in Adam Scott's Ben Wyatt and Rob Lowe's Chris Traeger. Now, they initially, they were brought in as adversaries for our beloved Parks Department. And Scott does portray a similar kind of character as Brandanowitz, but he's much more of a geek and much more of a better match for Leslie. He's also just much more charismatic and efficient with the dialogue he's given. Rob Lowe is on comedy gold form here as the ultra-positive and help-obsessed Chris Traeger. Parks and Rex has been described as a warm hug of a show and all the characters are generally well written and positive except for their constant torturing of Jerry. But if you need that pandemic pick me up and you haven't seen this show before it's also got one of the most perfect final seasons I think I've ever seen. Mm. Originally it was only going to run for six seasons but it was given a reduced order for a, tw uh, a seventh season and what it enabled the showrunners to do was give each character a fully realised send off and complete the arc of every outstanding storyline thread from the show. It feels like a victory lap for a show that started life very shakily as a poor man's office clone, but ended up, one hands down, one of my all-time favourite sitcoms. David, have you seen Parks and Rec? Well, I knew you were going to start talking about it, so I started watching it. I'm on the second season at the moment. Uh, like do you hate Mark Brendanowitz with a fiery vengeance? I, I already kind of do, yeah. He is a slime, he is a scumbag. But like, I like, I already like the sort of the political beats that it has. Like, it hits some real key issues that are out there, like gay marriage, for instance, in a lot of American states. You uh, are now, of course, referring to the gay penguin marriage. Well, yeah, the gay penguin marriage in season, the first episode of season two. I mean, I feel, I feel like stuff like that in in these sitcoms is just. It's genius, and it, it, it needs to be included. And don't forget, this show is um, 11 years old now, so that episode's about 10 years old, you've just mentioned. Mm. So they were doing it 10 years ago, which is great. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, I think it's, yeah, it's a good show. It's good. I'm enjoying it at the moment. I'm going to continue watching it. And trust me, it'll only get, it only gets better as it goes on, and it's just got one of the most perfect final seasons, I think, of any show. It does not jump the shark, David. It gracefully slides over the shark. It does, it does and not keeps jump swimming. the shark. Please tell me you know the phrase "jump the shark." What are you talking about? You don't know the TV phrase "jump the shark." Why are you want to know? No, God. Okay, so when a show, a good show, becomes bad, it's referred to in the term terminology as "oh, the show's jump the shark." Jump the shark is originally term from an episode of Happy Days, where Fon Fonzie himself literally jumped a shark on a motorbike. And that was a point where everyone who watched Happy Days was like, that's bollocks, we're not watching it anymore. Hence, jumping the shark. So when a very good show does something terrible that it can't recover from, it is called jumping the shark. Wow, well, you learn something new every day. Yeah, so leading on from the parks department to a family that has a lot of parks, I've just finished season four of The Crown. Uh, Neil, have you watched anything about The Crown? <sighs> I've really not bothered with The Crown, David. I've got to admit, I mean... A drama about the royal family literally sounds like one of the last things I'd I'd want to watch ever. Right. Well, I I thought the same thing. I mean, I'm not. I wouldn't I wouldn't say I'm a royalist, but I don't hate the royal family either. I think they they do what they do for the country. What you what you learn about is the the family drama that went on that goes that that went down in this family. I mean, it's like it takes every other drama. To, to a whole new level, because it is the family. It's, it but, is the royal family. But how much of this is constructed? Because obviously, I, mean, I, it's, I guess it's certain obviously... story points are known, because it's history, but yes. other points, they're just imagining conversations and building to what they think yeah, happened, I mean, right? It is, it is good to say. It is, it is good to say that this is obviously a dramatised 
version of events that have happened during during the reign of Queen Elizabeth. In fact, wasn't there a little uh, fuss a while ago with this most recent season where I think it may have even been the royal family themselves wanted Netflix to put up a disclaimer at the start of the show saying this is fiction. Yeah, yeah, they would because they, they again, did, a yeah. lot of people go, and it's true. A lot of people see something historical. Uh, set in the past, they think it's real these days. Yeah, based it's on actual events. Well, yeah, people or... are getting dumber. Uh, quick, quick side note: I was watching um, for all mankind, Apple TV's alternative NASA show, and it starts off in the sixties. And we were watching it with my parents, and obviously, it's it starts skewing away from what actually happened in history to it's the show's own storyline. So when they've built a moon base, I literally one of my parents said, "I don't remember when they built the base on the moon." I was like, "That's because it didn't happen." But because it's been presented in a historical <laughs> context. <laughs> People think it happened or it's real, and that's one of the dangers of a show like The Crown. Yeah, yeah, it did definitely fall into that. Um, but with 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 The Crown, uh, season one and two, uh, they change casts every every two seasons. There's a completely new cast because we're going through different generation, uh, a different time period in the Queen's life is what we're going to be focusing on. Uh, season one and two, I thought was hands down the best season, uh, mainly because they had this fantastic power dynamic that was going on between the Queen and Prince Philip. It was the dynamic between the Queen as the head of state and the Queen of England and Prince Philip as a male and a husband and his role in the family as the head of the family because he's a man and Prince Philip's this masculine, man's man kind of gentleman. And with the Queen being the Queen, the crown always took precedent. And there was this really brilliant, it was a power vacuum that was happening between the two. That sort of deteriorated when Olivia Colman took up the role of Queen Elizabeth. So, in so what three. you're saying is the shows, one and two were good and then it's just kind of limped along since no, season so three. I wouldn't, say, I wouldn't say it limped along, no. Season three and four are still good. Olivia Colman's seasons are, are good in their own way. So season three, I felt like it became very much... This happened during. This was a, an event that happened during the Queen's reign, and then this was an event that happened during the Queen's reign, and then this was a happen event sort of thing. It was my very my, much my, my most my biggest question is, when do they stop doing it? And this is the thing that's going to. So there's going to be surprised. two more seasons. There's going to be two more right. seasons. Now here's uh, the thing, right? I I know for a fact now they are going to. The 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 one thing they should not portray, and they're going to do it. They're going to do Princess Diana's death, aren't they? Yeah, that'll be in the next season, most likely. Now, most likely in the next season. They are, unless they handle that correctly, they are going to cop so much shit for that. I mean, and let's not even get into the fact that Harry, Harry and Meghan have got their own Netflix show as well now. So, I mean, what? Do they have to run it by him? Probably not. So that's going to be interesting. I just, you know what? I've got no interest in watching that at the minute. There's too it's, much better it, stuff to Neil, watch. Try, it is very good. I, d I definitely think you'd you, like you it. Just said you, that, might no, not but, think, you might not think you would, but you, you but definitely But you just would. said it started really good and then it hasn't no, lived no, up no, to those heights uh, no. season, since... Season, so season three, I felt like it did sort of... It struggled. It wasn't as strong, but it was still a good show. Season four is where I feel like it came back into its element because it brought in another sort of power struggle between the Queen and Margaret Thatcher, which was really interesting to watch. Mm. And then it also had, mm. the, and it also did the strenuous relationship between Charles and Diana, and it did not pull any punches. And Here you it go. Even, it, went, it went quite graph, like horribly into Diana's um, eating disorder that she had. Um, I believe yeah. she was bulimic. And it depicted that in such a, like, such a way. And Josh O'Connor's, um, his performance as Prince Charles, that man can act. He was my famous. He's been my favorite performance throughout the entire show. And Mate, here, at the end, at the end of the day, I, 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 I've got. I think a lot of biopic things. This is like you know biopic movies. If I've got no interest in the people the show's about or the film's about, I'm probably not going to watch it. I feel. <laughs> I feel like that's such a. Oh, it's, that's a, such a shame. I shouldn't like a narrow way of looking at it because you sh just because you're not interested in the factual people that like you're not interested in the royal family yeah but then i'm just watching a uh, but then i'm yeah, just that watching doesn't mean a drama it's a bad show it doesn't mean it's a bad show i'm not it's... saying it's a bad show i'm just saying i've got no interest in it <sighs> i i I, I, cl I can clearly see that it's won loads of awards and a lot of people like it but it's just personal taste i've got i don't want to see a bunch of people that again are based on real people where they're making up stuff to fill in the gaps of what actually happened 
Um, just what to I create drama. Is, it, just, had, uh, it had no. one of the most heart-wrenching TV episodes I've ever watched happened in The Crown. Was one this the, the minus one? It, yeah. Um, it was but the, it was the, I heard it about was that. The, yeah, the, cult, the, the one where the... Um, but that's down to the, the incident the happening. Died. But that's down to just a shocking event happening. That You could have portray that event from how other people dealt with it and it would just be as shocking don't you think but it's i think it, the fact that it was real well yeah of course it was real but i'm that's, saying that's what that's what gets you and how yeah. it's how it's handled is beautiful i would say david i think it's time for you to take off the crown okay here you go um so the last thing I <laughs> after yet another tenuous segue uh the last thing i've watched this week was Greenland on Amazon Prime the other night, which I thought was going to be yet another Gerald Butler shouting and trying to punch something like Geostorm film, where, you know, basically tried to punch the weather. But in fact, bar one fight, a smashed window, and maybe one accidental hammer in the head, this wasn't really an action. <laughs> an accidental hammer in the head. Right, yeah. So there's a fight scene where a couple of guys are fighting, and of course he's Gerald Butler, so he's clearly going to win. Uh, they've got weapons he hasn't, and um, he gets a weapon at one point. And he may um, accidentally jam the hammer in someone's head. And I mean, and that's like literally how, the most... How vo- can you accidentally hammer someone in there? It's not like you're going to nail something and someone... Because he's, he's Gerard Scottish butler. So he's like the power of iron brew and smacked him in the head with his, the ha- his own hammer. So like, it's got his own fault for bringing a hammer, uh, bringing a hammer to a Gerard butler fight. Um, but this isn't an action film. If you were going in thinking, oh, this is going to be like 2012 or the day after tomorrow, you're going to be sadly disappointed as the film's only got a small £35 million budget and it doesn't extend to massive worldwide scenes of destruction. What you do see of the destruction is really well shot and it's done on a smaller scale. Um, Instead, what you actually get is Butler acting with really good support from Morena Baccarin, who um, you might know from Gotham or Homeland or Inara from Firefly. Although they have got one of the most spectacularly annoying kids in the film. The second I saw this kid, I was just like, please let him get hit by an asteroid early on, because at least then they'd have something to be grim about. <laughs> but no, it's... what well, The thing is, you've seen oh, one of these types of films... For that for a kid's death. Lovely, lovely. Well, you know, I, I, look, honestly, I'd rather the pet dog survives in this film than the kid. The I kid's so annoying. I think would rather the dog survived in, any yeah. mo- in anything. I mean, you'd rather watch, like old grannies and all the children die than seeing like a dog die in a film. Right, so I just said about a small annoying kid and you've just essentially no, want to wipe no, out all old people and children. If you want to bring a dog into a film and, say, and you're going to tell me, okay, one of these characters is going to die, it's either going to be dog or it's either going to be this cute child, I'm going to want the cute child to die. Fair enough. I don't, I don't, <laughs> want, to, you know, I don't want to see... Obviously, just, in a just, film setting... David, obviously, yeah, I was about to say, glad, glad you clarified that with in a film setting and just not <laughs> advertising child murder in general. Um, but the thing is, if you've seen one of these films, then you think you know what to expect, right? Oh, the family's going to go out and they're going to try and make it to safety and uh, they're going to run into bad people here and bad people there. But you know what? The script really surprised me in places. It didn't stick to all the typical turns. And, you know, for a, for a B-movie with Gerard Butler in it about a giant asteroid, I was surprised by, like, the many different obstacles that the family had to face in the film. Definitely kept me guessing till the end. So, um, yeah, if you have the time, Greenland is on Amazon Prime right now. Yeah, yeah. I haven't seen it, but I mean, there's a lot to get through at the moment. But I'll, I, you know, if you say it's a decent film, good recommendation, I'll add it to the list. Main feature. So on to today's main feature, and where it's been a shit show in the last year for cinemas, uh, TV has literally been a lot of people's saving grace. We've had all the streaming services out of our ears, uh, with Netflix, Amazon Prime, Apple TV Plus, uh, Disney Plus launching last year. And um, it's just, TV has definitely been a lot of people's saviour in the past year. Yeah, Disney uh, Plus could not have chosen a better time to launch a streaming service. <laughs> I mean, literally, yeah, the week after lockdown started. is just, yeah. Um, Perfect but with, with that almost, in mind... It's almost like they knew. You cannot say Disney Plus. <laughs> no, we're not even going to go there jokingly, man. So what we're going to look at in today's main feature are our most anticipated shows of the year. Um, so for me, I'm going to start off with season two of Netflix's The Witcher. Now, Netflix were definitely hoping that The Witcher could be their Game of Thrones. It's an adult fantasy, it's got monsters swearing and copious amounts of nudity, and it's show run by Lauren Schmidt-Hissrich. Now, the first season definitely delivered to fans of the video games 
and the original books by Polish writer Andrzej Sapowski. But although it was a massive success for Netflix, I don't think it quite garnered the same critical adulation as Game of Thrones did. I think part of the reason for this was choosing a very non-linear storytelling narrative when the show jumped between different time periods. And without yeah. explicitly stating that it was doing it, myself as a fan of the games, even I got lost at some points on my initial run through. However, I think there was a very good reason for this approach. I feel like I feel like with that approach, they were almost trying to do the sort of twist that you had in Westworld season one, where there were two different time periods going, and it, it, it yeah, it didn't it didn't work, did it? Well, I, I mean, I think the first season was largely made up of standalone origin stories for our main three characters and also little chapters because the original Witcher books were a collection of short stories from that world. So each chapter was Gerald going to another town, killing a monster and you know, bedding someone yeah. again, as he as he's wont to do. What the show had to do was establish more than just Gerald. He had to establish three main characters. First of all, you've got Henry Cavill's Gerald of Rivia, who is a magically enhanced monster hunter, who is our Tachichia Witcher. You've got Anya Shalotcha, who is Yennefer of Vengerberg, a sorceress who keeps crossing, crossing paths with Gerald. And last but not least, Freya Allen as Ciri, the crown princess of Sintra, who spends most of the season on the run, but is destined to meet with Gerald. Now, we've mentioned each episode jumping between timelines, and I think, as we've said, it's quite jarring, but I mean, at one point I was like, wait, that character died in the first episode. Why are they back now? What's going yeah. on? Yeah, there but was a lot of that. I think I think the reason why the showrunners chose to do it this way um, is because if you look at uh, the plot lines of the show, they were little short stories. Now, arguably the most successful adaptation of the source material was in a multi-award winning Witcher 3 Wild Hunt video game that came out in 2015. I mean, that is one of the few games I've never traded and played multiple times because the voice acting and the storytelling and just the sheer plots and subplots in that game are amazing. Yeah, I think there's a reason why it won Game of the Year, didn't it? And there's a reason. Oh, why. exactly. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. Ama- it was one of the best games I've ever played. Instead, think of season one of the show as a primer for the bigger lore and stories of the Witcher universe. I think by focusing on the smaller short stories of the original books. This allows the showrunners to give some time for the characters to breathe and establish the world of the Witcher, because if we dive straight into the Wild Hunt storyline, there would just be so much exposition and plot to get through every episode that you wouldn't really care about the characters and um, the world, the wider world in general. I think by the end of season one of the show, chronologically, we are around the start of the Wild Hunt storyline anyway, so I think the upcoming second series is going to be an even bigger success than season one, because, as I say, Cavill is just no perfect as Geralt, and I'm sure we'll be tossing some coins to our witches again this autumn. And on that note, one of the shows that I'm really looking forward to coming out hopefully this year, but it's probably going to be next year, is Mike Flanagan's Midnight Mass, his next horror show coming to Netflix. He's stepping away from the Haunting series, at least in title, and he's focusing more on a community than one haunted building this time around. Uh, The synopsis of the show is very short, but it's a community experiences miraculous events and frightening omens after a mysterious priest's arrival. Now, with that, there's not a lot to go off, but Flanagan loves his building a family feel to his to his uh, to his films, obviously with uh, to his show. Sorry, obviously, with The Haunting of Hill House, there was the direct family and all the problems that they had going on. And then in The Haunting of Bly Manor, there was a sort of group of strangers and friends that built a friendship and a family bond together. Now with this one, you can expect the similar sort of themes, but it will be more based around a community and a whole town. That town is going to be the eeriest, spookiest town you're ever going to see. I think anything that Mike Flanagan touches at the moment is pure gold. I mean, we mentioned him in the last episode. But and he he's just a, f- a fantastic writer and director. Uh, are you looking forward to Midnight Mass, Neil? Yeah, do you know what? I think I'm looking forward to Midnight Mass more I, I, than I was the second series of The Haunting, uh, because as as I, I, I think what happened with The Haunting season two is now a lot no, a lot of people like it, and but to me it wasn't a patch on season one, and I feel that Flanagan. I know, and that's heresy for you. <sighs> I had I had the, the sucking of breath, yeah. but. No, to, but like as they say later on in that haunting of Bly Manor, oh, this isn't a ghost story; it's a love story. Mm. Yeah, and there was not one bit that made me jump out of my out of my boots. Were you and not terror. scared like, about the lady in the lake? No, see, see, I think I think Flanagan absolutely knocked it out of the park with season one of the haunting. But I think what happened was he got constrained by 
I don't want to say Netflix told him, but you look at season two and it's running through a lot of the similar tropes. Um, you know, after watching the first season of The Haunting, you know the type of language filmically Flanagan's working with. So you immediately start suspecting everything. You go, oh, I bet they're ghosts. I bet they're ghosts. And you know what? Yeah, pretty much everyone's ghosts in these things. <laughs> and right. for me, that just takes that just takes the fun element out of it. And like you said, it wasn't scary to me. I think Flanagan didn't really have a choice though. Like he, he he's like where he said they say later on, oh, it's a love story, not a ghost story. Well, that's him trying to do something different, right? Because if he had just been a standard horror story, it would have been just like season one again. So I get why he's trying to do something different, but I think. There's nothing in that season that made me shit my pants like that scene that you know I know you want to talk about that in scene, season one of The Haunting. The, that scene or in The Haunting of Hill House. Uh, I think everybody, everybody who, who watched has watched the show shit their pants when that happened. And we, I, I bet a collective brown. Anyone, out anyone that's listening to this will know what I'm on about. Okay, it's it's the car scene. That car scene was so well done. It was the best jump scare I have ever, ever seen in any film. And there's there's a reason there's a reason why. So with with what you expect from a horror film and with jump scares, like you take a James Wan horror film, so you take uh, The Conjuring or Insidious or whatever, you know, like let's like with with, with horror films, you know when there's going to be a jump scare. There's a formula to everything. It's musical build. You'll get say they'll go towards the door, they'll open the door and then nothing will be there and then the next minute the music will drop and then there'll be a loud rah and then the monster will come at them from the side or whatever. It's all, like you meant, like it, it treads the same beat pretty much all the time and you can predict whenever anything's going to happen. What Mike Flanagan does in that scene is completely disregard every rule of horror that we, have, we as an audience have subconsciously built from watching horror over the years. And he does it so well from the, I mean, I, I even said to my girlfriend when I was watching it, don't, cause she, cause she was frightened out of her skin. I said, like, don't worry, they're in a car, we're safe. Nothing's, nothing's, nothing bad's gonna happen in the car. There's no scary music. Nothing, yeah, nothing bad's gonna happen in the car because we've been, we've been taught throughout everything that the car, a car is a safe environment in a horror film. And Especially if it's moving on the road, right? Yeah, the, and if it's the, stopped somewhere, yeah, you're going to get the, murdered. The, but if you're having a conversation and driving... And exactly, talking. exactly. And the two characters at the moment were having... A, at, at that point, they were having a deep argument. I can't remember what the argument was about at the moment, but... But it we, sucked we you as, in, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, we as viewers were so sucked in to what was happening in that argument. And we knew that the environment was safe, nothing was going to happen. And then, bam! That scream... It, that, yeah. I, I, t I never leapt so far from a jump scare in my life. It was the it was perfect, and you can, well you've got to give and try and, Mike Flanagan credit in the, every and way leaping possible. back and trying to leap back to Midnight Mass. Right, yeah. I'm hoping for more of that. <laughs> <laughs> more. Yeah. Well, and I, do you know what? I, I I'm looking much more forward to Midnight Mass because, as I say, I, I've got all my faith in Flanagan. The only thing that may go against me uh, liking it. Is depends how good the writers are on this show. I don't really know much about that yet, but the hauntings, the two seasons of the haunting and Doctor Sleep, <laughs> both you know all based on classic horror novels. So his own material, or uh, you know, a less experienced writer, we know he's got a directorial chops to uh, handle a, a horror and scare the living piss out of us. So I'm just hoping he can do that without the constraints that he had with season two of the haunting. For me, the season two of the haunting felt like a remix of season one because he'd been told. You've got to have a bit where a character's dead and they don't realise it. You've got to have a bit where this happens to a character that happened in the first season. Uh, in, this, in the second season of that, I feel like he wasn't trying to create that Ben Lady reveal. I feel like he was trying to do something different. Like, we, we knew that... Well, we knew it was a shock, right, was, in season one. He was one. playing on the fact that we already knew... With the, the well scene reveal. in season two. Yeah, I know, yeah, with the well. I think but no, it was, was a shock, shock in it. What was the shock was that it just happened, literally, right as she that turned up. That was what the that shock That wasn't was. a shock for me. For me, that was just like, uh, bothered. As I was watching that, to be honest, man, you are you are a, a heartless being. I I, I want to say, if there is anything in Midnight Mass which is as well done as that Ben Nick Lady reveal and the jump scare from Haunting of Hill House, then it's going to be a bloody good show. And from one bloody good show to another show where our characters kill lots of people when there's lots of blood. Uh, and that's it. I'm talking about Barry season three. Now, 
David, do you know anything about at all about Barry? Only what you've told me previously, but I've not seen it, no. Right, well, let me tell you about Barry then. So, I'm really looking forward to the long-awaited and delayed season of HBO's Barry. Um, this was created by Alec Burke and Barry himself, Saturday Night Live and all-round general comedy legend Bill Hader. Now, it's only a 30-minute show, so but it is a dark crime comedy. It starts off well enough as a quirky black comedy, but by the end of the season one, it goes to some spectacularly dark places, and it really elevates Barry to one of the best shows around. I mean, we're talking Breaking Bad good here. So, what's Barry about? Well, Bill Hader plays Barry, a professional hitman, who is tiring of his job and the unglamorous lifestyle that comes with it. He's always looking for a way out, but keeps being pressured into more jobs by his handler, Fuchis, played to slimy perfection by the great Stephen Root. On one job, Barry has to kill an actor and instead befriends him and ends up at an acting class. Initially terrible at acting, it does awaken something in Barry and he decides he wants to become an actor as he's able to tap into the dark recesses of his past for motivation. There he meets Sally Reed, an aspiring actress played wonderfully and ignorantly by a great Sarah Goldberg whose sole focus is only on herself and becoming a famous actress. Barry then tries to maintain both parts of his life while keeping them separate from each other. Uh, a special shout out's got to go to Henry Winkler, the Fonz himself, as Gene Cusimano, who again is in career best form as Barry's acting coach and mentor. Has he uh, jumped any sharks in, in this one? Yes, you've learned! He does not <laughs> jump any sharks. Um, I will say the show has another star making turn from Anthony Carrigan. He's the most overwhelmingly positive and nice and least violent gangster you will ever meet from Chechnya called Noho Hank. He's just. Every, every episode you see this guy in, you honestly fear for his survival in every episode because he's such a bad fit for the lifestyle he finds himself on. Imagine Tom Haverford from Parks and Rec, but suddenly dropped into gangland things. And that's what it's like. You're looking at this guy who's more interested in like nice clothes and like the internet than he is on like actually running a Chechen mob. Sounds like, like a lovely gentleman. He's, he is one of the nicest bad gangsters you will ever meet <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I mean the show really does take a dark turn with a shock of a season one finale and what happens in that finale sets up an even larger plot point that just hangs over Barry's head for the whole second season so unfortunately season three was due to start filming last summer and as recently as last month filming still hadn't begun but there is good news because in that layoff time Hader confirmed the other day that the team had only not finished writing all of season three but a, se a fourth season of the show as well now, HBO execs are already hinting that a season four renewal is likely for the show due to its success uh, in the first two seasons. And even more good news, filming on season three finally started just a couple of days ago. So from a hitman who likes, from a hitman who's trying to stop killing people to a bunch of cops who keep killing people. Yep, it's the BBC's flagship drama, Line of Duty, season six. Now, I know one thing, and that's catching Bent Coppers fella. And with that line, the man, the myth, and yet another legend, Ted Hastings was born. Now, I will admit, I was very late to the Line of Duty party, having only just binged all five seasons in the middle of last year. And uh, this was after various other podcasts and family members had told me it was amazing. Yeah, I think I resisted it as I was still quite snobby about, oh, well, it's just another BBC procedural police drama. I was very, very wrong, David. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think I'd put Line of Duty up there as probably one of the best shows of all time. Of all let time? Alone of all so you time. put it up there with like the Breaking Bads and the Wires. And yes, right. hands down. In fact, wow. I would say um, it's definitely got the DNA of what I would say is like a British Wire. Um, what people love about the Wire is it starts small with one little case they're working on and it expands out and world builds each season till you get a full portrait of the city. Mm. Yeah, it's definitely got some DNA of a British version of the Wire. It starts small in one case and then throughout the following seasons it builds up the story and calls back to stuff that happened in other seasons. Um, but what is Line of Duty? It's essentially the story of AC-12, an anti-corruption unit, whose job it is is to catch bent coppers, and it's run by Irish cliché machine Ted Hastings, played by the absolutely brilliant Adrian Dunbar. And he's supported by his two main detectives, Steve Arner and Kate Fleming, played by Martin Constant and Vicky McClure. Now, what makes Line of Duty stand out from the run-of-the-mill police procedural is... Each season features a guest star or two who will be the focus of a corruption investigation by AC-12. Season 1 had Lenny James, seasons 2 and 3 had Keely Horse with her now iconic portrayal of Lindsay, Lindsay Denton. Season 4 had Tandy Newton's DCI Ross Huntley, while the last season featured the always excellent Stephen Graham. Uh, for the upcoming season 6 we've got Kelly MacDonald joining the cast. 
But what makes Lionel Judy so good, other than the guest stars? Well, Jed Mercurio's writing, for one. The interrogation scenes are like Shakespeare. They are legendary. You have the criminal, on, the would-be criminal on one side. <laughs> you, you got really passionate there. You were like, it's well, like it's Shakespeare. It's so well done. It is. I mean, it's it's just two, it's, it's usually three to four people in a room talking, and you are on the edge of your chair watching this because it is so well written. These interrogation scenes are like an action scene in another show. This is the bit you're waiting to. The, the bit where they have everyone in the table and they go through the same lines they have to say, the same bit of legalese every episode, and then they hit play on the recorder and you get that tone and then the camera cuts and every it's just just that tone makes you uneasy. But the whole point is they have to prove are these people guilty or not. And in this world of Line of Duty, it's never black or white. No matter how much Hastings the boss thinks, it's straight they're either guilty or they're not guilty. And as the seasons progress, we slowly learn more about the personal lives of our three main characters. But also the smaller side characters are really well written. We get constant callbacks to plot lines from earlier seasons. Uh, the acting is top notch across the board and the show's focus on cases rather than personal lives of the characters just pays off in spades. It just shows you how committed the characters are to solving the cases and we only get small glimpses into how the events of the show affect their lives. I love that plot threads from early seasons can come back in later seasons and then take over as a main plot line of that season. I mean, bar the main three characters, and even then, the show tries to cast some doubt on them. Anyone can be corrupt, and anyone can be killed at a moment's notice. The main plot line since day one has been trying to expose who is running the OCG, an organised crime ring that has links to the very top of the police and the government. And if you watch the show, just like the rest of us, you are still wondering, who is H? David, do you know who H is? Why won't you tell me, you bastard? <laughs> it's been five seasons that I watched in about two weeks, and I need to know. I can't wait another year or two, because apparently there's going to be more seasons. Look, it's just... it's. It, it does I'm amazed like, you've not seen it. It does, no. I, it is one of those shows where I've, I've, wanted, I've wanted to watch it, and I probably would really enjoy it if I did watch it, and there is no real excuse for why I haven't watched it. I just haven't. It's been, what, like five years now? And I still haven't watched it. And seasons one to five of Line of Duty are all available right now on the BBC iPlayer. So, you've got no excuse, David. Well, I've had no excuse anyway. I've, st- I've just not Yeah, but now, it. they're just at a click of a button. All of it, in one go. Another reason you have no excuse is there's only six episodes a season. 50-minute mm. episodes? Uh, mostly 50 minutes, closer to an hour... And there's a couple of season finales that are closer to 90-minute films. Oh, okay. So from Ben Coppers and Crime to, well, nothing really links with um, <laughs> the next two shows David's going to be talking about. And I believe you've got a twofer for us. Two shows for the price of one. But that's a hell of a price. And what are the shows, David? Well, you couldn't think of a segue, but I like the effort there, Neil. I'm going to be talking about Amazon Prime's epic fantasy series, Lord of the Rings and Wheel of Time. Now... A lot of people will obviously know of Lord of the Rings, and like, like if I was to pass a normal person in the street, they'd understand what the Lord of the Rings is. But not many people would have heard of the Wheel of Time. So the Wheel of Time is a epic fantasy written by Robert Jordan, and of course he wrote the series called The Wheel of Time with the same name. Uh, the showrunner is going to be Rafe Judkins, who worked on Agents of Shield and Chuck. Uh, the show is going to be very much based around that chosen one story arc. Uh, there's this man who is chosen to defeat this evil that is in the world that is currently prison- imprisoned. However, his like emergence isn't a good thing. It's bad that this person has come along. The chosen one's called the Dragon Reborn. And Neil, I think they're taking a very similar approach to like The Witcher and Game of Thrones, where they're casting one name actor that you know, and then a lot of unknown actors. So the name actor in this one is uh, Rosamund Pike, who's playing Moraine. And, um, Probably most well known for uh, Gone Girl. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and um, the Emmonsfield... And Doom. She was awesome in Doom. She was in Doom? Doom. Was she? Yeah. Okay. With The Rock yeah. and Monsters and Mars yeah. and Hell and Doom. Yeah, I know. Demons, I'm just, yeah. I'm just, I think I've just blanked and that film out of my memory. Um, but it had Carl Urban as well. Well, anyway. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> the, Back to um, Middle Earth. <laughs> so, The Emmonsfield Five. 
are all relatively unknown actors. And I think the show is definitely, especially well, for the first season anyway, is definitely going to play on who is this drag, who is the dragon reborn. So I don't want to get too into the plot and spoil it for you because I have, I'm currently reading the books at the moment. There's definitely going to be that mystery behind who is the dragon reborn. If you have a look at their Twitter account at the moment, they have recently tweeted some of the most amazing concept art for the show. I mean, uh, Shadna Logoff uh, looks so good. It looks so for, for the, good. Uh, for, the, for the uninitiated, David, what is Shadgra Logoff? It is a... It's pretty much a deserted city. It's a deserted city which has been tainted. And it's just... If you look at the art, it's just... You just feel so real. And We might have to uh, retweet that on our official Twitter there, David. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. It looks... It looks beautiful i mean a lot of the concept art in this show looks good if they can get the if they can make it look as good as the concept art does then we're going to be in for a real treat and uh, we've also with the showrunner uh rafe judkins he's going to have a lot of detail to go off uh, because one thing that a lot of people criticized robert jordan about from the wheel of time is his he loved detail he will literally write about the string that someone has tied their buttons together with that's how in depth he's gone in creating this world. So you have there's... literally hit the nail on the head of why I actually stopped reading. Um, yeah, it's not for just everybody. like you. Well, I think it's a it's a problem that epic fantasy writers tend to have, right? I mean, I, I actually got into Wheel of Time when I finished Game of Thrones all those years ago. Uh, I was like, "What is like Game of Thrones?" And everyone was like, "Oh, Wheel of, Time, Wheel of Time." Okay, cool. How many books are there? Oh, there's about thirteen at this point. Yeah, okay, thirteen cool. uh, prequel. Yeah, and that was my biggest problem. I thought the first three books in the series were amazing. Really set the stuff, like you say, epic fantasy, hero, journey type of story. I really liked how it was setting up. I couldn't wait to see where the story was going. And then we got about two or three books of just describing everything in such <laughs> minuscule detail. Do you want to know what type of mead they're drinking? Do you want to know where it was brewed? Great, you're going to find out. <laughs> Do you want to know what colour the button was on some Chester's hat? Because there'll be a sub-story in about five chapters about it. Robert Jordan um, did love his detail. But I think all of that, everything that you're mentioning there, the critics, like the critical aspect of his writing, it only goes to be proved to be a good thing when it comes to recreating it as a show. Because every, like how immersive you can make that show with the amount of detail that you've Well, they better get the bloody button colour, right? That's what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, but I mean, for, for, for me, it, um, the problem is the plot just stopped dead in those books. I forget, I think I was around books five or six, maybe. Four, five or six, somewhere around there. And the plot just, I was like, it has been like 170 pages and nothing of any note has happened. There's been a couple of meetings and some people talking and nothing has happened. But they've told me what the ceiling looks like in a room. <laughs> what the bushes look like outside um but yeah like you say i think one of the advantages this adaptation is going to have is there was just so much material in jordan's work there's a so, lot there's a lot he created a very well realized world and with culture different like yeah the culture of dis different races and it's yes yeah, I, I did see there was very good diversity in the casting as well which is good and i mean a lot of that was there in the books so that leads and uh, that leads me on to the next show which is obviously going to be a lot more popular than the wheel of time when it first releases which is going to be uh, lord of the rings now though we've recently dropped a synopsis for the show which i'll read out to you now uh, it's going to be an epic drama that's set thousands of years before the events of tolkien's the hobbit and it's going to take viewers back to an era in which great powers were forged, kingdoms rose to glory and fell to ruin, unlikely heroes were tested, hope hung by the finest of threads, and the greatest villain ever to have flowed from Tolkien's pen threatened to cover all the world in darkness. Beginning in a time of relative peace, the series follows an ensemble of cast of, an ensemble cast of characters, both familiar and new, as they confront the long-feared re-emergence of evil to Middle-earth. From the darkest depths of the Misty Mountains, to the majestic forests of the elf capital of Linden, to the breathtaking island of Numenor, to the furthest reaches of the map, these kingdoms and characters will carve out legacies that live on long after they are gone. That's the official synopsis that we've got for the show. If we could afford any music, I would have been playing some in the background. 
<laughs> for that brilliant description there, David. Thank you, thank you. Well, it's what we know about it so far. I mean, we know it's going to be filmed in New Zealand. We know it's already going to be one of the most expensive TV shows ever. Well, it's going to be the most expensive TV series ever, and I think a lot of people are going to tune in for just that reason. I mean, it cost it cost um, Amazon two hundred and fifty million pounds in a bidding war against Netflix just to get the rights, just for the rights to use it. So even before they've even thought about what they're going to do, it's already cost more than most TV shows will ever cost. And then they've also pledged, I think, a billion pounds over five seasons that they've got the rights for. Uh, it, to put that into context, the Lord of the Rings trilogy cost two hundred eighty-one million in total. So it, I mean, Amazon are going big with the Lord of the Rings TV show. They're going all in they are on the going ring, all in, and they need it to be a success for them because they need to take that chunk from oh, Netflix. That's. That's a surprise to me, right? Like, they're the fact that they're doing The Wheel of Time and Lord of the Rings at the same time. When you look at epic fantasy novels, they are literally the two most well-known and biggest ones going. But yeah. to take on both at the same time, I think, as we briefly discussed earlier, I think The Wheel of Time is going to have an easier time than Lord of the Rings because it doesn't have the associated baggage. I feel like they're going to be able to pick and choose what they want mm. from Jordan's books yeah. and curate something that's a lot faster moving than the books and will hopefully draw in a big audience that want that adult epic fantasy. Lord of the Rings, on the other hand, I feel they're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. If the show's not immediately successful, immediately, it's going to be deemed a failure. If fans don't see, you know, the famous locations that they've seen from the original films... They're going to see the famous locations. I mean, they're definitely going to go to some of the same places, and we're going to get to see new places such as Numenor. Um, we're going to see the Numenorians, and, uh, and we're going to have, like, characters that are going to reemerge that we already know of, like a lot of the elves and Sauron's going to be back. I mean, Orlando Bloom needs to work right, and he's already got one show on Amazon, so I'm sure he's going to rock up at some point. And everyone, everyone of a certain age, every girl of a certain age, will be like, "Wow, he's got old." <laughs> I don't think there's going to be Orlando Bloom. <laughs> yeah, he won't be sliding down any elephant trunks, firing arrows in this one. I don't think. He'll, by the time this gets out, it'll be on his walking stick. But uh, no, yeah, I, I, I think. I think they're going to be hamstrung a little bit, the showrunners, with the Lord of the Rings show. I understand, by the fact yeah. That they, I understand what you mean. I think They I have think, to set it... People expect certain things from it. Yeah, I think it's going to have a massive audience for them at the beginning. And then it might slowly deteriorate, depending on what they do. I think what they've got is, with, with the source material, there is gaps in history where the writers can fill that gap with as much detail and, as possible. And if they don't get the right people in to do that... That's where they're going to come and, in with problems. And if I'm right, a lot of the stuff's coming from the different appendices and indexes and some of the similar... Simil yeah, I think it's like the end of that the, book. Uh, the book I can't say. Yeah. The Begins yeah, of S. Yeah, it's, it's sort of the so, end of that book, yeah. And, uh, I think what they're going to do is get a mishmash, mishmash of that. But it is interesting that you're going to have two very similar shows that, when you boil it down to its most basic story component, is the same story. You know, you know the hero's, the hero's journey. It is, I mean, it's, of it's, 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 yeah, the hero's journey, the chosen one. Yeah, I mean, we don't actually know exactly what the Lord of the Rings is, is going to be about. Oh, I do time, know that we know exactly what it's going to be about, especially if you've read the books. You know exactly mm. what's going to happen in that show. So, here's the thing, though, David: Are you going to finish all fourteen, fifteen, or sixteen books by the time yeah, the first episode? Yeah, well, not comes by the out? time the first episode airs. No, I'm on the fourth book at the moment, and I'm uh, I'm getting through them at are a you decent, gonna, steady pace. Are you going to feel bad though when the episodes and seasons of the show? Overcome your reading of the book. No, I'll, like, I'll probably, no, no, stop if, releasing if, them. If, if there's, if there's a, if it takes them over a year before between seasons, then no, I'll be, I'll be way ahead of them, and I'll be finished before they'll finish the, uh, the, the show. For I, 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 you, you can come back to me when you get to around the midpoint of the, 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 the fifth, the sixth book, where I just lost it, and be like, yeah, he really talks a lot about stuff. <laughs> <laughs> that's 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 literally what the next couple of ch books could be called. Chapter chapter five. He talks a lot about stuff. Yeah. In rooms with talking. I mean, having said that, that kind of thing of where it's a lot of conversations in rooms and talking lends itself well to keeping the budget down and a good TV show. So I think where you were saying about the showrunner for Lord of the Rings, Rafe Judkins, I, I'm a little bit on the fence over him because Chuck was awesome. Chuck was a really good show of its time. Did you ever see Chuck? Uh, I did not. Chuck was a brilliant show. Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. angers me because it started off with all this great fanfare to launch this so assumed crossover of the MCU 
movies with the TV shows. And you had Samuel L. Jackson guest starring in early ones. Uh, Jamie Alexander as Lady Sif from the four movies turning up. And then when the whole Disney merger took over, it literally became the red-headed stepchild of the MCU. It's like, hey, Coulson's over here. He's alive still. No one cares. But we've got scrolls in it, except we'd already brought them in the year before Captain Marvel, and now we don't know how to write ourselves out of it. Yeah, so you were, and you're, the what you're saying is just... you think he's, his writing when it was came to that it was a bit... Well, yeah. I'm not sure... He... Uh, and that was more of an never... adaptation as well, which is similar to which is the Wheel of Time. Whereas was Chuck an adaptation, or was it original work? No, Chuck was an original story, yeah. as was um, Agents of Shield. The, the problem with Agents of Shield is when it was good, it was brilliant. But by the last couple of seasons, I mean, I just I I could barely follow. It. Like it was, I was really just not over it by the end. I like had to watch it to see how it finished, to see if they was going to do anything cool to end it, and they didn't. So perhaps perhaps it's a thing where he's cut his teeth on this show. And he now knows those are the mistakes not to make on... I mean, I don't think... I think there's going to be a lot more people than just him around, like, keeping an eye on it. So, um... Well, I think with The Wheel of Time, they do have a showrunner that has worked on previous projects. Unlike The Lord of the Rings, which I thought was bonkers. The two showrunners on Lord of the Rings, Patrick McKay and John D. Payne, have you heard of either of them before, Neil? I have not. No one has. No one else. Although... They literally have nothing on their IMDb page, and they're being given, and they're the showrunners the for the, the most kingdom. expensive TV show ever. That's bonkers perhaps, to me. There's perhaps, something, perhaps they know something where the bodies are buried. Um, but and, and, and another thing that I think the Wheel of Time might have a slight edge over with the Lord of the Rings is its magic system. Its magic system is well realized, understandable, and. Does anyone really understand? I, I, aside from like proper, proper like people that are Tolkienists. Gone, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, could you could you tell me why Gandalf has magic and nobody else does? Just I did not. But yeah. well, yeah, yeah, because he's a wizard. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, but why? why he's got he, a beard why and he's got only, a staff. Like, why are there only three wizards that we see in the entire show? I mean, I realise there's the Blue Brothers or whatever. I, I think getting back to the the main thing is um, yeah. Amazon have put a shitload of money into both of these shows. And I think, as you mentioned earlier, I think fans are going to try and pit them against There's each other. There's going to be that natural competition between the two, for sure. Which is bizarre, because they're on the same network. I mean, I think if Amazon is smart, what they'll probably do is, once one show finishes, literally, the next week, the other one will start. Yeah. And so you'll have this, like, what, I'd say 12 to 20 week thing every year of Wheel of Time for three months. Yeah. Lord of the Rings yeah. for three months. Similar to what uh, Disney Plus are doing at the moment with One Division. With the and Marvel shows, is going to come out, and then yeah, it's no, it's a uh, Falcon, Falcon, and the Winter Soldier is coming that's next. That's coming next. Uh, okay. I believe okay, that's sorry. two weeks after the last episode of One Division, okay. which will then be followed by Loki, and then Hawkeye later in the year. I mean, if you, if you make a mistake on the internet about the MCU, you're going to yeah, get you're going to so. get burned. <laughs> yeah, they'll be burning you at the stake. And Neil, you've got uh, one last show for me, and I believe it's your top pick. Yep, my top pick for the year is the fourth and final season of Netflix's dramatic pause. Ozark. <laughs> now, for me, <laughs> was that for dramatic? me, oh, was that was that pause really necessary? I don't, know, I don't know if that was it a dramatic pause or a Jurassic pause because to it put, took am so I long. I have to put a little drum roll in there. I mean, if you can, that'd be great. <laughs> uh, but yeah, for me, the best drama on TV currently and the natural successor to Breaking Bad is Ozark. The story of the Bird's family descent into criminality and fights for survival as they try to juggle dealing with mobsters, rednecks and Mexican drug cartels. Jason Bateman's never been better playing Marty Bird, the money launderer who initially gets his family into trouble, forcing their relocation to the Ozarks. But as the seasons progress, his wife Wendy, played by the superb Laura Linney, gets much more involved in their criminal enterprises as do his children. Now, what I really liked about the first season was that the Bird family thought they could simply come into town, manipulate all the lo local rednecks, and that's not what happens. Instead, they find themselves spiralling from disaster to disaster, where by the end of some episodes, it just seems their main objective is to stay alive. One other key difference and positive from Breaking Bad is that the rest of Myers' family quickly find out about the situation they're in, and they just have to go with it. The, the teenage children, uh, Charlotte and Jonah, are not your stereotypical annoying teenagers. They have, end up helping their parents out and they generally deal with a situation about as realistically and about as well as any of us could in the circumstances. 
Uh, has to be a special shout out to Julia Garner's searing portrayal of Ruth Langmore, for which she has rightly won the Best Supporting Actress Emmy two years in a row, and you won't bet against her winning a third time again this year. Every line that comes out of Ruth's mouth is like a verbal assault on her ears. I literally, she comes up with some of the most amazingly combative dialogue and some of the best creative insults you'll ever hear. So if you want a searing crime drama with pitch black humour and you've got a spare 30 hours or so, let's face it, we all do, then you've got to check out Ozark. Yeah, I watched the first three episodes of Ozark about two months ago and I liked them, but I haven't watched them again. I didn't have that urge to go, oh, you know, I really want to know what happens in the fourth episode. It sort of just... Oh, it was one of the, it was one of those where it just petered out for me. Nothing. I feel like it didn't. I wasn't it doesn't peter out. Like if I anything, said, it peters up. I think I mentioned to this in the last ep- in the last episode. Where, like if if a show doesn't grip me early, I'm not interested. And I believe I insulted your whole generation for not having the attention spans of Nats. Yeah, but you, yeah, but it, with with the amount of content that's out at the moment, that's at our fingertips, I don't want to be spending four or five episodes of a TV show for me to get into it. If an, if an episode do doesn't do... get me on the first episode, I'm not interested. But that's terrible. That that means back in the day, before you was born, or when you were like four, when the X-Files first came out, people wouldn't have bothered with the X-Files because it took a season to get going yeah, really well. Yeah, well, maybe. maybe Friends, maybe. like loads of shows that weren't hits. That's where the we're one at. Show... That's where we're at. We've got, we've got so much content to choose from. And, it take, and it, let's face it, it takes up a lot of time. Why would I spend why would I spend six cent seven hours trying to get into a show which I know I've been told is good, but then not but then potentially miss out on starting something else which I'm going to enjoy more and that would have gripped me more from the beginning. Well, David, I, I, this, your solution to that problem is you basically watch what I tell you, like on here, because I've seen stuff that's really good. You do as I told. <laughs> Exactly. And you look at reviews on you know podcasts like ours and other podcasts that are available out there and just look at what the critics say. Um, I'll give you a good example today, right? There's a new film coming out yeah, but called... Do, do critics, the critics said Star Wars The Last Jedi was good. We're not, we haven't got enough time left in this year to talk about <laughs> Star like, Wars now. I like then. how that just brought you to dead silence. No. Yeah. Okay. Well, do you know what? I think there, that's almost all the time we have for today. So I hope you've enjoyed this latest episode of We Needed Roads. Uh, we're going to be aiming to get a new episode out roughly every two weeks. And I'd like to thank everyone who listened, downloaded and shared links to our first episode. And shout outs to our listeners out there, not just in the frozen and wastelands of the UK, but also in Ireland, Canada, France, Chile, Israel and the Ukraine. Uh, we've also had our first listener request via Twitter for our thoughts on Tom Green's psychotic early 2000s film, Freddy Got Fingered. Uh, I think that means you were about eight when this film came out, David. So it's right now on Amazon Prime, and we are going to talk about it next episode. Thank you for uh, dishing away my age there, Neil. But yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and watch it. I mean, <laughs> Freddy Got Fingered. It does not sound like a film I'm going to want to watch. Freddy Got Fingered. I, I, would, I would not watch it with your parents or... <laughs> No, I'll definitely watch it. But if I'm uh, if I'm going to have to watch this, I'm going to give you something to watch as well, Neil. And we could talk about it next. Okay, episode, oh slightly. dear. I want you to watch Hamilton for me. It's on Disney Plus, and I know you haven't seen it, and you've got to watch it. And it, it is about f- over three hours long, but it's amazing. Which seems unfair give when Freddie Got Fingered is a solid eighty-eight minutes. Yeah, but Hamilton is good. Okay, I don't think I'm going to like Freddy Got Fingered, where I know you're going to like learning about the $10 founding father without a father that got a lot further by working a lot harder and by being a self-starter. Okay? You're going to like it, Neil. Trust me. I I will watch it if you promise to never rap on this podcast again. I can't make that promise, Neil. So I guess we've both been given our watch lists for next week. I feel like David's might be more of a punishment watch than mine, as, like you said, everyone generally loves Hamilton. I'll tell you, the reason I haven't watched it is I haven't had three hours where I can actually have the TV on loud enough to have the music blaring out, and I don't want to watch it wearing headphones. So on the next episode, we will be going to our requests, and I will be watching David's request of Hamilton. I just need to find a spare evening with three hours where I can actually have the TV loud enough and not have to wear headphones. Whereas David will be forced at gunpoint, maybe with sticks near his eyes, to watch all of Freddy Got Fingered. Also, we're going to be taking a look at The Vanishing at the Cecil Hotel, Netflix's latest true crime documentary. I'll be looking at Dead Pixels on E4, Apple TV's Servant, and the much-heralded Saint Maud. I'm sure David will find shows to talk about as well. (laughs) Well, I don't know if I'm going to want to watch anything else after I've watched Freddy Got Fingered. It might ruin media for me forever. 
Daddy, would you like some sausage? Daddy, would you like some sausage? What? What? Once you've, once you've watched Freddy Got Fingered, it'll all become apparent. I don't know if I'm going to want to know what that means. What that is. Also, if I say to you, you need to get inside the animals. Inside. Okay, okay. Let's just, let's just, let's just stop there. <laughs> and finally, I'm the backwards man, the backwards man. I can walk back as fast as you can. I'm the backwards man, I'm the backwards man. I can walk back as fast as you can. Okay, if I'm not allowed to rap anymore, you're not allowed to do that. That's not really rapping. That was just, again, from the, the comedy just, masterpiece just, it is, Freddie Got Fingers. Any of these references before I've watched it. Yeah, but I, I feel like it's, it's gearing you up for the film. Now when you see if the... Anything, the it's making me not want to watch it more. When you see the absolutely cinematic work of art that is a Daddy, Do You Want Some Sausage scene, you're going to be primed now. You'll be like, yes, I get it. Awesome. So I hope you've enjoyed this week's episode. We'll see you next time. Goodbye. Roads.